Hello, my name is Dennis Gillum. I'm the Chief Wizard of Product at the Indie Game Academy, and I'm here to talk to you guys about what we have to offer you in order to give you the best production skills that you need in order to create your first game. So you wanna become a game producer? Well, you've come to the right place. But first, here's the agenda. For those of you who need structure in your lives, this is the order in which I'm gonna talk about what it means to be a game producer. And hopefully by the end of this, you either feel very inspired to wanna to take the path on organizing teams and produce, or you think this is not for you at all and possibly design or testing is a better choice for your career. But before I get into the nitty gritty details about being a producer, more about me. So in my career, I've had experience doing production on all different types of products, from creating a theater production, from being a RA and creating programs for students, from being in aerospace, which those pictures aren't here, but I did have a career in aerospace before I became a game developer. And I also myself went through the Indie Game Academy's program and served as a prefect and produced a game called Bento Boss. There'll be more on that later. So I've been throwing this word around producer so many times, but what actually is a producer? We know we're not talking about produce in the grocery store. A game producer is responsible for the organization and execution of a game product and standardization of workflows. So I say game product to be specific because game products they consist of features, they consist of workflows, they consist of all different types of things necessary in order to get that end product to its user. So that was a lot of jargon that I just used. But over here on the left, I broke it down a little bit further as to what I meant by organization, execution, standardization. When it comes to organization, you'll have so many, in large studios, you'll have so many teams that are required in order to make just the simplest of animations, just the simplest of game features. When you're thinking about Call of Duty or Halo, you have your art teams who is creating the environment, that immersive environment, in order to make it feel like you're actually on the battlefield shooting an enemy. You have your system designers who balance uh, what weapons are OP and what's not. You have your audio designers that try to give that nitty gritty feel to when you're actually hearing sound effects happen around you that actually feels realistic. You have your narrative designers that create the overall story to keep the player immersed within the gameplay, et cetera, et cetera. All those teams, if there was nobody there to interconnect them, they would go off into their own silos and do their own work. And when it comes time to submit to a publisher or submit to the game store in order to release the game, you'll have one big, large mess of really fine products created by these individual teams, but nothing is actually cohesive and creates the game that the players want. That is where the producer comes in. The producer is the glue that connects all these teams. The producer is the web that connects all these teams together and makes sure that teams are communicating uh, any problems that they may have or any successes that they may have. You need your teams to communicate in order to make sure the right game features being built. So if you want to do a quick exercise in terms of defining your personas, you can do this on your own. We have three made up characters here before you. We have Paolo, age 32. We have Wanda, age 48, and we have Quinn, age 11. Each of these three, they play games at different rates. They play different types of games. You have Paolo, who, even though he's in a wheelchair, he still it has nothing to do with the fact that he still enjoys playing first-person shooters. He enjoys playing strategy games. You have Wanda, who plays a lot of her games on Facebook. She plays a lot of casual games, and she really likes the community that she plays with. Uh, and you have Quinn, who is just starting to get into gaming, and so having mechanics that aren't too complicated and easy to jump into along with animations that are very flashy and very cartoonish is something that really appeals to her. So looking at these personas, you would break down what it is that they like, what are their interests, what are some other products that they personally enjoy, and think about the game features that you can include that would attract these types of players. So you have your plan set out, you understand what your milestones are, you understand what features are needed for alpha, beta, and release. So now we're getting into actual execution. Problems are gonna come up. They always come up. There are always things that you cannot plan for. And it's the producer's role to stay in tune with each of their teams, with each of their teammates, to make sure that their work is being done on time. And if there are any things that come up that can impede them from doing their work, it's up to the producer to unblock that. So over here on the right, we have a really great example of one of the pit crew members. He got to the problem as fast as he could, and he's pounding away with his hand trying to get this dent out of the hood. Whereas his teammate just arrived there with the hammer ready to pound away, but he got there too late. When it comes to 
producing games along with in NASCAR when the car comes to the pit, uh, you have to deliver your product on time. The people in the pit crew, they have to get their car ready as fast as possible so they can get back into the race. Similar to a producer, if there's an issue that comes up, you would like to unblock it as fast and as efficiently as possible so everyone can get back to work and so that your game is delivered on time. Looking at the timelines that you have to juggle, you have to see are, are people doing too much work? Are there people who are doing not enough work? You want to make sure that your team isn't overloaded so they don't burn out and then go somewhere else because the cost to replacing people can be pretty high. All those skills that are gained, all the knowledge that is gained from developing a game, if you have to put somebody there who has no knowledge of the game at all, it will take them a little bit of time to catch up. So you want to make sure that the people who are working, they are comfortable with what they're doing and they're unblocked and they're having a good time. And is there enough manpower to get it done in the first place? Because if, there's a, if there isn't, then you as a producer will have to step in and fill in the blanks until help can arrive and you will become unblocked and you can get back to overseeing the project. So before I continue with more examples and more text boxes as to what it means to be a producer, how about I just show you guys a practical example? So during my last cohort with IGA when I was a prefect, we as a team in house warrior we decided to create a mobile casual game uh, for 2021 and 2020 there was an explosion of casual gamers an explosion of people who play mobile games and the demographic that those platforms appeal to the most are women between the ages of 18 and 35. because we had women between the ages of 18 and 35 on our team they talked to us about the they talked to the team about what it meant to game when they were younger and the type of games they like to play. We didn't have a lot of experience in our team in creating games, so we wanted to create something simple and something that we all as a group enjoyed, which we didn't really know it at the time, was that we all enjoyed playing dress-up games. We all enjoyed character customization and we wanted to implement something that had those type of features. A lot of people during the pandemic, they took up cooking and we thought that if we created a game where you could make a plate similar to as you would do on Instagram, where you would make have a really beautiful plate and then take a picture of it, share it with your friends. If we can create a game that replicated that without you having to cook food, you just put really good looking food on a plate, then it could possibly be a big hit. And so we decided to experiment with that. So here is the intro to Bento Boss. During IGA, we will teach you how to prototype your ideas before you go into full production. So this here is what's called a paper prototype. We actually went into Google Slides, we found images of food, we created a fake bento box, and we created a little game to see how fun is it to actually create your very own bento box with the food that was given here. And surprisingly, it was actually really fun and satisfying, especially if you had nice sound effects and really nice calming background music to aid you as you create your very own dish. So with that being completed, we moved on to our digital prototype. Our paper prototype was basically our MVP, our minimum viable product, minimal viable play testing game, as if you will. Uh, because we had the basic features down from our paper prototype, we were able to map out what would be needed in order to create the digital prototype, which is going to be in 3D. So as you can see here, this is the spreadsheet that I used in order to plan our first phase on how we would get to alpha. I divided it up into the art assets, player controls, and UI that we needed. We needed audio and we needed features for the community so they can share their work automatically with the touch of a button. But for the MVP for the digital prototype, that would have been way too much work. So we just broke down the absolute bare minimum features needed in order to decorate your bento box in 3D. On the very far right is an actual vertical list of the features that were needed in priority order. And what you see here, as you can see, like it steps down through art player controls UI. That is just showing how many tasks we have and where help will be needed as we get closer and closer to our December 22nd deadline. So this is just a quick example as to how IGA will teach you how to prioritize your work. So now you have gotten through your alpha phase. Every, the team has an understanding as to what type of product they wanna create. And there are tasks that are 
a little repetitive. They're being done over and over again. At this point, as a producer, it's time to start standardizing some of these processes. When you have tasks that need to be repeated, it needs to be put down on a document so that that way, in case the person who's responsible for that feature being built is out, we're human beings. Sometimes we get sick. Sometimes we have other priorities. Sometimes we want to go on vacation and we need a day off. If that person is out, you as a producer are responsible for making sure that that work still gets done and that someone is able to step in and take over for that person who is out. And you can handle that through good documentation. It's also the role of the, of the producer to ensure that the teammates have enough capacity to complete the work that's being assigned to them week over week. Here at IGA, we teach you about sprint planning. Every two weeks at the start of the sprint, um, you will plan out what needs to be done within the next 10 to 14 days. Each teammate has the capacity of how many hours of work they can do per week. Each task that is on that feature list that I showed you in the previous slides should have an estimate of the amount of hours it would take to complete them. And as a producer, you monitor as to whether or not these estimates are correct. You monitor whether or not teammates actually say they have the capacity that they have. Some people, they say they have time to do work for 20 hours a week, but are only completing five. As a producer, if you see that, then you only assign them five hours of work per week as opposed to the 20 hours. Or perhaps you need to restructure the project as a whole. When dealing with people who are funding your project, they want to know that the date that you say the game will be done, it will be done on that time because they have other projects that are going on in their mind and other things that need to be done that coincide with that date in order for the success of this game. So you have to be able to understand what your teammates are working on, understand how quickly they're getting things done in order to give accurate responses as to when your game will be completed. So a quick example when it comes to standardizing some work that we did on Bento Boss. On the left, you can see the menu UI that we have. When you click on those buttons, the food that you clicked on will drop down on the right. We saw that in the example before. So on this panel, um, our UX designer, she's really great at designing, but she didn't know how to program it. And so uh, our programmer, he was working on other scripts like 3D rotation and other fixing other bugs so that we had a good game performance by release. So as a producer, I had to go in and I had to figure out how we would create these panels according to our UX designer's designs and then document it so that she could repeat it. So looking at this grid, we have a six by three grid of 18 squares. Um, I was able to pick out each and every single feature that was needed in order to create this grid, meticulously write down each direction in order for somebody who's completely brand new to game design in order to get it done, and then hand that document off to my UX designer so she can complete the task. And she was able to get it done within just a couple hours as opposed to having to figure everything out herself. As a producer, you will be responsible for creating these workflows all throughout the prop production of your game. So in case that does happen, you might even be able to, pu to pull another team member or perhaps even someone from the IGA Discord to come in and give you out the help that you need so that way your game can be successful. So to summarize this presentation, you have to know your players, know your team, and know your product. It's great that you want to create a Stardew Valley, Metroidvania type of game, but is there an actual audience who's available who will pay money to play that? That's something that you have to investigate and something that you have to be aware of when producing your game. You have to know your team. You have to know the experience of your team and understand how quickly that they can get work done. And it's not something that you can just guess off the top of your head, but you have to allocate the right amount of time in your schedule to experiment, to iterate, and then to actually get work done once the team knows what they're doing. And you have to know your product. You have to have an understanding as to how things are put together so you can give ac accurate time estimates to your stakeholders who are funding your projects. And execute, execute, execute. You have to make sure that your team has the morale needed in order to get work done. And when they do do a good job, let them know that they are. I hope you guys enjoyed this presentation about game production. And if you would like to hear more about me, if you'd like to speak to me, feel free to reach out me, to me at my LinkedIn or Instagram below. This work right here was not created by me, but produced by me in collaboration with four other artists. Um, 
and I hope you enjoy the presentation.